A famous explorer once said that the extraordinary is in what we do, not who we are. I'd finally set out to make my mark, to find adventure, but instead, Adventure found me. In our darkest moments, when life flashes before us, we find something. Something that keeps us going. Something that pushes us.
Levi here, just outside of San Francisco, California, at world-class development studio Crystal Dynamics, whose current project is the reimagining of the Tomb Raider franchise. From now until the game launches, we're going to be hopping around the globe, bringing you exclusive first looks at some of the key ingredients that are shaping and creating this world. First stop, Digital Domain, Los Angeles, California, to meet one of the most crucial pieces of the Tomb Raider puzzle, Lara Croft herself. I'm Zachary Levi, and these are the final hours of Tomb Raider. Digital Domain. This is where they do a lot of mocap for big Hollywood films and video games like Tomb Raider. And today, we are going to meet the new Lara Croft, who is around here somewhere. <laughs> Teaser! And this... This is where the magic happens. I think that might be the new Lara Croft. That's the new Lara Croft. Since 1996, many actors have played the part of Lara Croft, but for the reboot of this franchise, the team conducted an exhaustive international search for someone who could bring a whole new level of emotion to a character who's become so familiar. In late 2010, a young, English-born actress was chosen to become one of the most recognizable characters in video games. My name is Camilla Luddington. I'm a British actress living in Los Angeles. I am the voice and character of Lara Croft, the British heroine. When I was first approached for it, I, I really felt overwhelmed at the honor of playing an icon like Lara Croft, um, I think I screamed in my car, actually, when I, when I heard that I got the role. Lara Croft, one of the most iconic female characters in all of game. This is really her origin story, how Lara became the super badass that she is in later exactly. years. She is just a young, naive, perhaps 21-year-old who has a thirst for adventure. We're used to seeing Lara Croft as just the cold-hearted, almost killer, and she's a badass and everything. But I think in this, you see her struggle. You can do this, Lara. Please come and get me. When we went through the process of looking for actresses, the world over, I mean, this was Europe, 
This was LA, we had hundreds and hundreds of actresses that were whittled down, and we ended up with Camilla. She had sort of that rawness that we wanted. We, you know, somebody who not only wanted the part, but was willing to push her character into that emotional area that we wanted. Let's learn a little bit about Camilla. Where are you from? I am from a town in England called Ascot in Berkshire. And it's oh, like those things you wear around your neck. Like <laughs> really didn't do TV or, or film or anything until I got here in Los Angeles. But really, I had a stage background, which I also think helps though with this because this is almost feels like forming on a stage. It's... Yes! So here we are. This is performance capture stage. The volume. The volume, they call it. Oh, that's interesting. You'll have to explain that to me later. I don't uh, know why. I think maybe it's like a like a measurement thing, like height and width and depth. I'm going to go that with yes. creates volume. Yeah. Oh, I'm math sure. nerd. Oh. <laughs> and you also do get nifty props. Yes. And what's a fun fact about careful, this? Careful, careful, careful. Oh, you can hit somebody. Jeez. Wow. Is that um, <laughs> they'll put Velcro on this, and they'll be like, OK, you're going to have a gun and another gun, and they'll just stick to you. How much Velcro does a bazooka need to stay on tightly? Uh, a lot. There had to have been a lot of pressure as far as being the new Lara. It was intimidating. Did you go run around in the woods? <laughs> did you uh, <laughs> go hunt boar with a bow and arrow? Well, what's funny is I actually did archery when I was a kid. It oh, was, really? Yeah. At the time, you're thinking, why do I need archery? You know, when am I going to use a bow and arrow? And, and now, now I know Interestingly why. Interestingly enough. <laughs> no. No! Is Lara a video game icon? A sex symbol? I think she's both. Oh! Obviously, she's a game icon. But I also think she's a sex symbol because she fights for what she believes in. Um, she's courageous. And I think those things are, are sexy. The shorts are gone. That's I, a <laughs> Which I'm sure <laughs> most guys will think is a bummer. I like her new look. Yes, she's still gorgeous. But now she's a person. Camilla brings truth. She is truly uh, breathing life into Lara Croft. And when Lara is, is supposed to be going through this an emotional scene, you'll see tears streaming down Camilla's face, and it's real. People ran over to her, like, are you okay? Like, she's got mascara running and tears streaming down her cheeks, and she's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, wow. When I got this role at first, I did not even know that I would be crying so much. I just thought I'd be kicking butt. That was, <laughs> that was the Lara that I thought I'd gotten myself into. This was some of the most emotionally and physically draining work that I'd ever done. <laughs> this is the very first time I get to see this. have now seen Lara's first kill. What was that moment for you like? Intense, for sure. Probably one of the hardest things to film. She has to fight for her life. It's fascinating how she reacts to that. You know, she doesn't just walk away from that first kill. It really gets to her when you see her become Lara Croft. Camilla Luddington is our new Lara Croft. Strong, spunky, gorgeous, brave, how did she get so brave? Excellent question. We're going to cover that in our next installment when we sit down with the writers who crafted the origin story of Laura Croft. Don't miss it. Hey everybody, Zachary Levi here in downtown San Diego at Comic-Con, more specifically at Nerd HQ, which is the epicenter of all things Tomb Raider. The anticipation is building as the team from Crystal Dynamics continues to say that this could be the game of their careers. Today we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the story with some of the key writers and designers who are brave enough to tackle the origin stories of Lara Croft. These are the final hours of Tomb Raider. We're in downtown San Diego. We're at Nerd HQ. Fans, the public, will get to play the game for the first time ever. Are you nervous? This is the most nervous time of the entire game. This is huge for us. This is the first time we're giving anybody the opportunity to put their hands on the game. It's not finished yet. It's hard to, to send it out into the world like uh, that. It's a little young, it's a yeah. little fresh. When you put it in the public's hands, you're getting a very raw, unfiltered, like, hey, this is what we love and this is what we don't. You'll start to read about it now. You'll start to see it online. You'll start to get people's perspectives. We're making sure that we make it the best thing that we can for the fans. 
and these are the fans. Why make an origin story? You could just kind of continue with the Lara Croft Tomb Raider saga, but you didn't. Why? We didn't start with the idea of doing an origin story, actually. We started with the idea of doing something fresh. There haven't been very many games that have the opportunity to go back and tell a true origin story. There is very few games like this. In the history of the Tomb Raider franchise, there has not been a female lead writer until now, Rihanna Pratchett. For me, I didn't think of it like we needed a female writer to do that. Rihanna just nailed it. Rihanna Pratchett. Yeah. Does it take a woman to know a woman? It probably helps, but I don't kind of think about it as much as everyone else does. So I tend to think of myself as being a writer first. There is some of me in her, absolutely. She's very bookish, she's very in her head. I went to public school, I actually learned archery. Um, Camilla did as well, I heard. That we bring up our ladies properly. Um, <laughs> and I, I genuinely studied Egyptology. I wanted to be an Egyptologist. No way. You know, I've always been a huge fan of, of kick-ass females. I mean, I yeah. grew up on Terminator and oh, aliens. Yeah. You know, fighting aliens in the future. I thought that was what girls did. It's great to be here at Comic-Con. This is my first time. People are really responding to this, this kind of new Lara. The fans have been great. They've been very supportive. I want to kind of live up to their expectations. I grew up going to fantasy and science fiction conventions. Now here I am looking at a Tomb Raider poster on the side of a building for a Tomb Raider game I have written. Can't quite process that, but it's very cool. Lara's actions affect her character and her emotional state, and so the first kill for us was a big thing. <laughs> it's not comfortable to watch, and it, and it shouldn't be. Oh, God! And it is about picking yourself up, despite the fact that you're scared. You can't have bravery without fear. In video games, you're kind of tweaking all the way down to delivery. Yeah. Blessing or curse? Games development can be um, quite harsh on narrative. You know, you, you can lose levels or characters. You have to be amazingly flexible. When is the script finally finished? You get insight when you see it through your audience's eyes. Yeah. So once the story gets to a point where we can start sharing with people, where we can start putting it on the screen, then we start to understand, are people getting from it what we want them to get from it? The feedback is that it's really fulfilling our primary goals of delivering a story that introduces people to a Lara Croft, but also just takes them on an amazing adventure. <laughs> John Stafford, you're kind of the, the dialogue typist, uh, <laughs> word monkey. The words that you've been speaking for yeah. so long yes. are so from this man. Everything that I've been through that's been extremely emotionally draining and painful, I have him to blame for. <laughs> so we'll have words later about it. What were the challenges stepping into the heart and mind of a character like Lara Croft, who we've known for quite some time? Yes. Players of expectation is you want to just jump right yeah, in, guns yeah. blazing. Controller, I'm, you know, I'm awesome. I'm awesome. We want that. That's what video games basically allow yeah, gamers right? to feel. Yeah. I am awesome. The challenge for me is to show her vulnerable. Be shipwrecked on an island inside the Dragon's Triangle. Still have a very playable game, but also show real emotional character. It's very difficult to do that in game. Please come and get me. You can do this, Lara. When you have really extreme circumstances, you have really extreme emotions. What the hell? It's all about her survival. She's basically willing to do whatever it takes. And there's people trying to kill you. Um, you know, things are really extreme. Listen, I'm gonna get you out of there. I promise. I promise that. I didn't want any lines to sound gamey. There was a good collaboration of making sure that really that didn't happen. That's very difficult writing, you know? How do you Mm. write a line that isn't just like, I should go there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, that's... I bet there's something hidden in that crate. <laughs> yeah. I want you to love this game in a way that, that really feels like the first time you played it, but do it in a way that people have never seen before. For me, it's, it's crazy not to, to look at this as, as an opportunity to really start that dialogue. This is the game of our careers. This truly is the first time to sort of say, okay, this is it. Well, now that we know a bit more about what it takes to reimagine an icon from the ground up, we're headed east to go behind the sounds of Lara's journey, a journey that is heightened and shaped 
by cinematic score and sound design. I hope to see you on the next episode when we talk to who's behind what we're hearing in Tomb Raider. Everybody, Zachary Levi here in the heart of London's famous West End. Behind me is BAFTA, the British Academy for Film and Television Arts. Why are we here? Excellent question. Uh, for starters, Tomb Raider, the series, has garnered a lot of love and accolade from BAFTA over the years. Uh, some of the key players on Crystal's dev team are uh, BAFTA LA members. And to top it all off, legendary video game composer Jason Graves is a BAFTA winner. We're going to catch up with him in just a bit, but first, a little trip to Raleigh, North Carolina, where we go behind the scenes at Jason's recording studio. These are the final hours of Tomb Raider. The first thing we did was the theme. There have been many composers in the games or the films, but they've always used the original theme. They said, we want to start with a clean slate, new theme. I did it on piano, very simple. I was really scared just to send it because I'm like, I don't know, I think this really works, I think I like it. We ended up taking that exact theme, the first demo I sent was on the first trailer. That exact same arrangement. So, Jason, currently you're working on this reimagining of Tomb Raider. When you're taking on a new project, mm -hmm. what are the things that attract you to that project? The heritage of a particular game, I think, obviously. And don't even get me started on Tomb Raider. I literally almost drove off the road. I was on the phone with the audio director. Like, oh, stop light! And I had to pull over a little bit to not hit the car behind me. What I loved about Tomb Raider, what really drew me to the project was they had no pre-existing conditions. What because they do? wanted to get out of what mm -hmm. it used to be. They wanted something new, they wanted something fresh. Jason's done hundreds of games at this point. He was an easy choice for us to go with um, on paper because he had such great experience. I listened through a lot of different uh, material from a lot of different composers. I was really taken by how well he did the intimate stuff. The textures and the real like, you know, intimate and vulnerable bits that we needed to highlight in the game were a great match for us. What is square one for you when you start wrapping your head around and going, this is where I feel like this world is going to exist? Main theme, call me old fashioned. Then it was a matter of finding out what kind of percussion would work. And always going back to the melody and the theme, because that's kind of the heart of the game. The most signature thing that we need to get right is Lara's theme. One of our big goals was that it can be used in any emotional context. What does it sound like? High action. What does it sound like when she's in pain? For music, the gameplay and the concept art, especially with the, the scavengers and kind of the shanty town, corrugated metal, how everything's kind of this amalgam of different stuff that they found on the island. Like, that's what I want the music to sound like. The bad guys are playing the music now. Alex said something like, it'd be really cool to have something, you know, chains on a metal board or like you're banging a metal fence. A few weeks later, Jason calls me up and he's like, so this guy who's like the sculptor who lives right around the corner from me, I was talking to him about the idea of creating an instrument. And I'm like, that sounds completely insane. We have to do that. <laughs> Tackling the score to one of the most iconic franchises in the world brought a unique challenge. How best to capture the emotional timbre of the characters and island in music? People, I give you the instrument. The instrument. I was gonna let Matt determine the aesthetics. I was really only concerned about the sound that the sculpture was gonna make. Matt built this, which looks pretty much exactly like Laura's original homemade bow in the game. There's different timbres based on different materials. Metal, glass. It's a direct line from the plot, the characters, the story, the environment, straight to the sculpture. We always wanted the island to have that character in itself. Creating an instrument gave it this unique identity. It's like got a, a voice. Yeah. yeah. The very beginning of the game is, is nothing but the instrument. Ah! 
Who do you look at in video games or in film that you go, what they've done has shaped who I am and what I do for a living? They're all dead, unfortunately. What? Yeah, I know. It's classical composers. All classical? Yeah, I'm kind of going directly back to the source. Yes, yeah. yeah. Prokofiev's Tchaikovsky. Uh, even for uh, some of the scary stuff, you've got Penderecki, who's a Polish composer. Actually, he's still alive. It kind of goes back to ballets or opera, mm. which is kind of the precursor to film and right. video games. You know, they yeah. were telling a story. Yeah. That's what I love about that music. It, it tells a story. Even if you don't know the plot, you can listen to it. And film music's the same way. It's tough with games to do things that are subtle. You want to make Lara relatable, make her realistic. Got another one. She went down over there. Tell her story from the beginning and show how she became the superhero she becomes. One of the first things that I ask any developer is the emotion. Because mm -hmm. to me, that's the biggest thing that music can do in a tenth of a second. The music just, it nails the emotion. Well, wow, that was amazing, huh? I personally don't think I've ever sounded so good in an interview before. Although, Jason, Jack, and Alex are audio savants, so that would make perfect sense. I cannot wait to jump into this game, not just for the amazing action, but the emotion and mood and tone that they're going to set with their incredible skill. Um, tune in next time for a special secret announcement that is going to change the way you play Tomb Raider forever. See you soon. Hey everybody, Zachary Levi here. Over the last few months, we've brought you exclusive behind the scenes looks at the final hours of development of Tomb Raider. You've seen Camilla recording her last few lines, Rihanna using her last few words, and Jason completing the last few notes of the score. As those key pieces lock into place, it's time to reveal one of the last portions of the game and a team that's been shrouded in secrecy for two years. We're here in the beautiful and freezing Montreal, Canada, to bring you the final hours of Tomb Raider, multiplayer edition. These are the final hours of Tomb Raider. Welcome to yet another world-class studio in the Square Enix portfolio, Eidos Montreal, home of the multi-award winning game, Deus Ex. Locked away in one of the far corners of the studio is a team of experienced, passionate professionals who have been specially brought together to create the first ever multiplayer component to the Tomb Raider universe. Let's meet the team behind the vision, direction, and decisions, and hopefully get a chance to play a few rounds. Here we are at uh, Eidos Montreal. Before we get into why we're here, Carl, you now have <laughs> an amazing stash, my friend. What is the impetus behind this? Uh, so, uh, as a studio, we've been participating in Movember. A good friend of mine, JJ Owens, works for Movember in LA. Um, we set up the Gaming Challenge, and we brought studios from all around the world together. Uh, I think so far we've raised somewhere in a region of $140,000, $150,000. Well been, done. Uh, been a big success, although my wife doesn't necessarily always approve. She hates it? Oh, my no, wife no, wakes no, up no, no. She says that she hates it. She secretly loves it. What were some of the factors that led to a multiplayer facet to this new Tomb Raider? When we started developing uh, sort of our vision for reimagining Tomb Raider, on paper, it was all about single player. And as we started to build that world out, we had the island, we had the Solari and the scavengers. We started to realize that we had this canvas. Great warring um, factions, great landscapes. Yeah, yeah, we had all these really awesome places where it was all about traversal and single player. When we started looking at that, we thought, wow, well, what about multiplayer? Part of the genesis of that was Lara Croft and the Guardian of Light that kind of cracked open a door to lead you guys into the multiplayer into here at Idols Montreal. Guardian Light was a uh, downloadable, a smaller scale project, and that allowed us to sort of take the risks that we wouldn't necessarily take on a, a full-blown project. Guardian of Light was our Pixar short. It's the idea that whilst you're building your big project, you're always thinking about that next thing, but also allowed us to be able to uh, start understanding co-oping and networking. It was a game that actually brought Tomb Raider fans together for one of the very first times. You hear them in their ear and they were having fun. And as a result of that, that led to us thinking about multiplayer. <laughs> Hopefully our single player experience we're delivering is a very sort of single player, solitary, immersive type of experience. But at the same time, we believed tomb raiding together with friends would be fun. Tomb raiding, I think that's the first time I've ever heard that term. I, mean, I like it, that. It's, it's fun. You know, axe climbing and zip lining and, and the traversal that we get in there and the traps. For me, it was very sad 
to have that catch-22 of it would be great to do this in multiplayer, but we just can't split our resources like that. And that's how Eidos Montreal came about. We had staffed up our team to develop a single player. Everybody was gelling together really well, and it wasn't something that we wanted to just bolt on. We always said if we were going to do it, we are going to do it right. If you could have a fan play the multiplayer for the first time, what do you want them saying? For me, they're kind of different moods. It's not like I do one or the other. It's kind of like sometimes I turn down the lights and just yeah. play that single player experience. And other times I want to just jump in and have fun. And start and, killing and start pools. Start killing pools. Joe Curry, producer of multiplayer on Tomb Raider. Yeah. It's the first time Tomb Raider has ever incorporated multiplayer. Yeah. And you're in charge of that. Yeah. What's running through your mind when you get that call? Well, first off, exciting. Right, I mean, we're all huge fans of Tomb Raider on the team. I mean, we grew up with Lara Croft. Mm -hmm. But when we spoke to Crystal, like, we want to do multiplayer, and we're thinking, how do you do that? It's always been Lara's story. You've been in charge of creating the first ever Lara Croft Tomb Raider. No pressure. Multiplayer. <laughs> no pressure, Zach, thank you. What are some of the main pillars that you brought over from the single player to the multiplayer to make those two worlds cohesive? The element that really stuck out was survival. The group surviving together. Right. But then traversal, the ability to go up and down and, and kind of everywhere in a level. The weapons, you know, the characters. What did you guys have to tweak in order to create an engaging multiplayer experience that wouldn't necessarily work with the pieces that were in play with the single player experience? One example is the bow. Especially in, this, in the reboot, it's so iconic that we had to make it work for multiplayer. You have a certain forgiveness when you play single player. Multiplayer, players expect snappiness. I shoot you, I expect you to go down. Or you can just do what I do, which is take out the biggest gun and just run for them <laughs> and shoot them out. <laughs> the environment itself can be a threat. The Solari, you know, the guys that are on the island have had a chance to prepare traps. We've got things like an ammo box that looks like an ammo box, but it's really an explosive device. I need ammo, and, you th and it looks just like the regular ammo box, and then you're gonzo. We have a lightning rod. You'll get a lightning strike on the rod, and then you'll eliminate your enemy. First and foremost, we want to be humble. We want players to just have a really memorable experience. I had fun doing this. Do you remember when we set that trap? Moments that the players will come back to and talk about experiences that they've had for themselves, not necessarily the game offering them experiences. Absolutely. So, Joe, behind us we have the QA team, or the quality assurance team. They're a part of the development team. Mm -hmm. They can tell us what we need to fix and what's working and what's not. When do I get to game test? When do I get to get my hands on the game? Soon. We got a surprise for you first, Zach. So, when I was approached to host the final hours of Tomb Raider, essentially the biggest ask, not even ask, tell that I had was, I want to be in the game. I want to have a cameo, I want to have something. So guess what? Boom, boom, boom. I'm a playable character in the multiplayer Tomb Raider. How sick is that, Joe? You and your team are awesome. Uh, I can play with myself, virtually. Are we ready? Oh, you suck! Get those transmitters running. Radio transmitter activated! We're getting off this damn island? We send this thing. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> I would like to try and kick your butt as me in this map right now. Should Bring we it. try it? Alright. Bring it. Let's do it. It's happening right now. Oh, nice! Was that one of my traps? That was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these booby traps are really fun. I mean, they're really, really fun. <laughs> yeah! Don't worry about it. Just because you made the game and I beat him. <laughs> As you can see from the people and passion here at Eidos Montreal, this isn't just some add-on. They're devoting themselves to making this an experience in keeping with the feeling of single player. Familiar, yet different. Coming up in the final two episodes of our series, we go back to the home of Lara Croft. They're taking Tomb Raider to the finish line, and we'll be there for it. Everybody, Zachary Levi here, again for the final time, back full circle in Redwood City. Behind me, inside, critics and fans alike are getting some hands-on experience, an hour's worth of gameplay of pre-release code. Simultaneously, the studio dev team is hard at work crunching, optimizing, and polishing all the last little bits of code for what we will all come to know and love as the new Tomb Raider. It's a culmination of everything, and the clock is ticking. These are the final, final hours of Tomb Raider.
why we have a large audience coming in. We decided that uh, rather than going to one of our partners and just doing a live stream, we decided you come to us. Yeah. We have a big area in the studio and let's open it up. Have yeah. you ever done anything like this before? No, we've never done it because right now we've got we've got black curtains up around a specific area of the studio, which is our next big thing. Mm -hmm. Only a select few people have been allowed to come in right. and everybody's heavily NDA'd and now we're gonna bring you know, 80 plus people is the studio, but well, it's exciting, you know, to bring those type of people into the studio. They're the fans, they're the people who love it. And uh, we want people to, to be a part of our experience. On one half of the studio, all that is, is going on like yeah. crazy, but basically in half the studio, you guys are just pounding, yeah. like, working out every last glitch, every last yeah. bug, making sure that yeah. it's all just perfect, done and yeah. perfect, exactly, yeah. for, your, for your, your certs on yeah. Friday. Yeah. What happens when a game fails, sir? Then things start getting like, you know, sweaty around here. You know, you're dicing with, uh, with death right there. Well, you might be missing your release date. That's yeah. how big a day this Friday is. Yeah, it's huge. If we submit and they come back and say, hey, there's maybe 35 things that we'd like to change, then as a studio, we'll change. We'll, we'll improve them. Or there's small things that they say, hey, you know, this experience might be better if you just fix this little thing. Then of course, the team are literally sitting there waiting for that to happen. And there has been games I've worked on where we've submitted and within 24 hours, it would get kicked back and they'd say, eh -er. <laughs> yeah, you guys are crazy. You shouldn't have submitted it. So, there are 80 people yeah. in the office yeah. right now. You're five, four and a half days away from delivering this thing. And they're all they're strewn about. What are they all doing? So we have guys working out of very prioritized hit lists, right? So we right. say, okay, this is the most egregious thing that we've noticed lately. We'd like for you to focus in on it. What are you guys debugging here? Looking at some menu transitions. Oh yeah, we want to make oh, sure everything feels snappy yeah. all the time. Menu Looking transitions. Yeah. If I had a nickel for every time. <laughs> One of the toughest things with Lara as a character is her hair. Um, you try to simulate hair in a video game, and it's, oh, yeah. it's not always exactly the way yeah. it would be in real life. But that's something that um, I think the fans really point that out, and they want Lara to look as good and as believable as possible. So even in the home stretches, we're trying to sweeten it and make you believe it. So I spend a ton of time playing the game. So while everybody else is busting their butts trying to make it work, <laughs> you're having fun. That's basically <laughs> what you're saying. There's about 80 people right. that are all still busily working in yeah. this last week before the, the game goes to cert. Absolutely. One of those groups is called the what group? The OMS group. And what does OMS stand for? Uh, OMS is an acronym for oh my shit. <laughs> <laughs> and what does that mean exactly? When you're into the high octane moment, the only response that we were challenging the team that it could come back with was I would exclaim, oh my shit, that's awesome, right? right. Like, I couldn't even cuss properly. It could have been the O-M-H-G, the oh my holy god team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But oh my shit, oh my I shit, think it, is, it resonated. Is so many companies focus on the explosions, 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 mm -hmm. and we love explosions. I mean, there's plenty of them in the game. But it's also about sometimes that implosion moment, that time where you actually feel like you're part of that. Yeah. We have an early example in the scavenger den, very early in the game, where the camera is about six inches from the back of her head as she's in this claustrophobic moment as the ceiling gets lower and lower and the water gets higher and higher and the torch, you're worried, is it gonna go out? And as you suck in for that moment, if it's resonating with people, as we've seen it resonate here, you actually watch people who are claustrophobic kind of lean back in their chair a little and kind of react, and that's exactly what an OMS team is about. You feel confident that in four days, and four and a half days, this thing is like ready to ship and ready to rock and gonna blow people's minds? Well, how about we look at that? I got a board that'll tell us. Oh yeah, where's your board? Right over here. I'm a stats guy, right? Like, okay. It's gotta be like the McNamara version of reality, right? <laughs> so, and getting things done, like it's very NORAD, like with the update on where we are with bug counts. So we have the number of days that we wanna count down for, the priorities of what people are given against, and then an overview of how many things are remaining to be resolved per person. Carrie's got her work cut out for her. Come on, Carrie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, we have to figure out how do we hit the quality on a predictable timeline. So right. right now, we're trending towards being able to hit that in 12 days. But you need to deliver in four and a half. Correct. So what does that mean? I need to go right now. <laughs> Where is your head at right now, knowing that in four days, Yeah. It's got to be completely yeah, done. I'm super critical uh, of what we do. You, know, mm -hmm. you, you tend to be perfectionist. I'm absolutely that way. It's more like, this is leaving now. Yeah. You're done working on it yeah. because time's up. Yeah. And you're like, but there could be one more thing I can do. 
it's a weird feeling because it's been part of our lives for a very long time. How long have well, you been on it? Um, definitely four years, yeah. Like four, four years. years. Yeah. Four years. That's insane. I know. I was young. Yeah. Fresh face. I was young then. Yes. No <laughs> bags, no grey hair. Soul. Yeah. It's been a roller coaster ride, and during that time, we've been around the world. We've gone to shows. We've shown press. We've given hands on. We've had community events. We've been in San Diego with you at Nerd Machine. We've seen people excited to see this and play this game, and it's it's been it's been awesome. It's not just about Lara's arc. It's about the arc of people who've come in to the roles. You know, we've had people come in as animators and move up to the highest highest levels in their in their profession along these four years. So people have grown in these roles. Families have expanded, kids have been born, but we're coming to a point now where we're you know, probably 70, 80 plus days away from launch, and this phase has come to an end. You know, yeah. it's, been, uh, it's been awesome. With less than a week to go before console certification, the last few bugs to squash, and a general lack of sleep all around, this production is definitely gonna go down to the wire. Will they make it? Join us next time on the final, final hours of Tomb Raider find out. Over the last few months, we've followed the very talented Tomb Raider team through some of the most ambitious and innovative game development the industry has ever seen. In the next few days, they submit the final code for certification. If they pass, Game ships on time and everyone gets a much deserved sleep. If they fail, well, let's not talk about that. I'm Zachary Levi and these are the final, final hours of Tomb Raider. We've been around for 20 years at this point. Oh, wow. Yeah. In this industry, that's crazy. Yeah. 20 years of games, and many times we've, we've almost not made it, right? To generation transitions, or you've had, had ups and downs in terms of games being released. And for us to still be here, making games and being competitive, it's amazing. Is this pretty typical for you guys to be in the last week, and really all you've got left are these little bugs to yeah. do? Maybe it's uh, a few hundred still left to go. The team's cranking them out. You know, you're play testing it a lot. You get a QA, uh, quality assurance yeah, to make sure assurance, it's yeah. uh, make sure it's clean. You know, stuff's coming in still, as in like, hey, this crazy thing happened here. And simultaneously, IDOS Montreal yeah. Yeah. is doing what you're doing just with the multiplayer they are. Yeah, at the same time at because, yeah. because the multiplayer and the single player are being delivered yeah. at the at same, same time. time. Yeah, so it's a on big team. Friday. Everybody's got to come together at the same time, at the same moment, and put pencils down and say they're done. Pencils down. Mm -hmm. Done. Ooh, ooh. C, C, C. <laughs> We're submitting in four days. Let me tell you now, we've had to move Brian Horton. He was art director. He moved over to my department uh, in Brian about a month ago. There was a morning that he woke up and they went, you've created a beautiful world. Now step aside. So my job is I'm working with a very talented team in the brand to make sure we, our screenshots are good, to make sure we have covers for magazines. Posters. To, to make sure we have posters. Stuff, right. There's a lot of materials, just like in a film, Yeah. where when a film's done and in the can, yeah. you have to sell it to people. Yeah. You have to let them know what, what's cool about it. Yeah. Listen, I'm coming to get you. I'm going to get you out of there. I promise that. What's been great about this over the course of, of the entire process, you traveling around with us, is that we've been able to bring you the final hours of each of the pieces. Yeah. We've spent probably the last six months watching how the, the music's come to an end and the right. voice acting has to be done. So each of our episodes up until now has really shown a side of the final hours of that particular person's role in the game. And now everything's come to a head where we're submitting the game this week. The guys are, are tirelessly working. You know, the guys have literally, at some cases, slept in the studio. Okay, so launch day, let's say you were at March 5th now. Where are you? What are you doing? Um, I'm probably in bed trying to get 12 hours sleep. <laughs> so, because more than likely I would have been at some midnight opening the night before up till very late celebrating. So I'm probably nice. at, this, at this time of the day, I'm probably in bed. I think a lot of us won't even know what to do with ourselves. You get so heads down in something and it's been a part of our lives for, for years now. And um, you sort of get to that point where waking up in the morning, you're thinking about the game and going to bed at night, you're thinking about the game. I'll try to sneak a little time here over the holidays, but then, you know, wait till the dust settles and we really get this in the hands of the consumers before I can really relax, I think. Even though I've played the game so many times, I cannot wait to take the cellophane off that game. Yeah. 
pop it in. Yeah. It's the, it's it's the retail. Yeah. It's the retail copy. Yeah. And there's something special about that printed disc, putting it into the system, and you're like, this is the same game that I worked on for three years plus, and, and everyone else can have the same experience that I'm going to have right now. Yeah of all the taglines, whether they're actual dialogue in the game or marketing lines or whatever. Something that would sum up your experience yeah. in the last four years is a survivor is born. Yeah. A survivor is born in you, a survivor is born in Grizzle Dynamics. Yeah. We just wanted to be known as doing top tier work. There's games I look at and say, I wish I worked on that game, Yeah. right? Yeah. And I wanted Crystal to be that. And I think that with this one, we're gonna do it. Yeah, anybody can make an explosion look beautiful and make a world look phenomenal, but we now move into a period of time where it's about having a connection with something which is much deeper than just saying, I have a controller in my hand and I'm guiding a character around and, and, uh, and fighting or solving puzzles. There's a depth in the story that we're trying to tell, which hopefully for us is going to be able to set that structure for the future. Hopefully we've, we've taken the risk and we've been shouting so loud about this that we're actually carving what should be done. No! Oh, don't do this to me, you northern bastard. Are you excited? Are you nervous? I'm both excited and <laughs> nervous. You know, because we've been we've been masters of our own destiny up until this point, and, and now we're going to continue that right through to launch. And what's great is, is that from the very first presentation I gave with Daryl about here's the vision of the game, all the way through to the very first game sitting on a shelf on March 5th, we've been there for the ride. We've been on that journey. And then all of a sudden you reach March 5th, and you're no longer there's millions of copies of your game yeah. out there and they're in people's hands. And you're thinking, like, how are they playing it? Are they having fun? What are they saying? What are they gonna do? As soon as they put the controller down, what's the next thing for them? That they what do you tell want people? their response to be? I hope those people see that the story we've built and the foundation we've built is one that will last a long time. Doing something that's special is just incredibly tough, no matter what it is. You've gotta really want it. You have to be passionate. You have to care about it. Everybody realizes that this is a game of their career, and everybody wants to put as much time and energy into this as possible. We have a, a studio full of passionate people who have put their lives into making this thing happen. This is not just a game that we're just gonna ship on March 5th and people will go, great, I've got another game to my credits. This is one where the team are gonna look back and go, that was a journey. It's been an honor to be able to, to work on, on Tomb Raider, and long may I continue. I see this getting bigger and better over the next few years. Here's the soon-to-be world-famous archaeologist, Lara Croft, in her native habitat. She's on the hunt for the lost kingdom of Yamatai, home to the fabulous Himiko, mythical sun queen, and ancestor of yours truly. <laughs> Sam, this is serious. Oh, sweetie, I know. I'm just trying to lighten the mood here. Everyone's so on edge. What are you so worried about? I'm close to something. I'm sure of it. I just don't know if the others will listen. Or even if they should. Lara, you know this stuff better than anyone. Seriously, I'm not just saying this to make you feel better. I trust you, Roth trusts you, you got this. Now let's take a break, okay? Okay, okay. And Sam, thanks. She's not always this serious, you know? How can you suggest I'm not serious about this expedition, Laura? It's not just Sam's family funding us. I put my savings on the line, too. We've all got some kind of stake in this. The funding won't last forever, Whitman. That's precisely why we should push east, not west. No one believes Yamatai... No one believes Yamatai is that far east. The books simply don't support it. Well, whoever wrote those books never found Yamatai. I've talked to Roth about this. There's no point in following in other people's footsteps, Dr. Whitman. I refuse to bet my reputation on your hunch. I'm the lead archaeologist here. And when were you last in the field with a TV crew behind you? Got 30 years experience, two PhDs, one in East Asian history. So why don't you just stick to boats, Mr. Grimm? Ship, Dr. Whitman. It's a ship. Don't need a PhD to know Look, that. Going east will take us directly into the Dragon's Triangle. That's where we need to go. Laura, my little bird. 
I'd follow you almost anywhere, but that place is a bad energy. Bad storms, more like. Makes the Bermuda Triangle look like Disney World. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> the stories about Queen Himiko say she could summon storms. Myths are usually based on some version of the truth. What if Yamatai was somewhere in the triangle itself? Well, look, this is the satellite imagery from inside the Dragon's Triangle. That doesn't look good. If it's wet, I can sail on it. Oh, don't tell me you're seriously concerned. Ray is his right. We don't have the funds to piss about. It's now or never. Lara's offering fresh ideas and a plan. I'm the captain here. It's my decision. We're going into the Dragon's Triangle. Why am I even here? Melanie Reyes, it's a mechanical, not an electrical problem. Now, Alex. <coughs> <coughs> uh, this looks like it might be uh, an electrical problem. You think? <coughs> oh, hello. Hey. Is this little fox, oh, huh? Yeah, she's cute, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's Alicia. Alicia. It's my like daughter. That. Oh. 14 years old. And smarter than you'll ever be. She must must get that from her father. Don't give him the attention. And yeah. I'll take a look at this. Probably electrical. From her father. Nice one. So I was on the walk, right? Doing a spot of midnight fishing. Hey Grim, time to button down the hatches. I bet it with you. So I was on the lock, right? And this thing comes looming at me, looming out of the water it was. So I give it a old Glasgow kiss, you know. <laughs> Get shot of trouble nine times out of ten, that does. Took me a week to sleep that night off, and I've not touched a drop since. See you at dinner, Sam. <laughs> All right. Can we take B-roll, please? Thank you. Dr. James Whitman, filler 15, take three, and action. Okay, now take a firm grip, and then slice him down the belly, like this. Yeah, you got... Good Lord, cut! 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 Uh, is, is he coming back? <sighs> I'll go get him. Renowned archaeologist, a discoverer. The world-renowned archaeologist, Mr. Dr. Dr. James Whitman. Of fish. It's just a fish. It's I fine. It's just They're a gonna fish. be fine. This damned reality TV business. I'm, I'm meant to be bringing culture to the people, Sam. Not dinner. Uh, no offense, Jonah. The audience demands content, Dr. Whitman. You know that. So until we find the Lost Kingdom, we need footage like this. Come on, let's just take it from the top, okay? We're gonna make you look like Gordon Ramsay in editing. Dr. James Whitman, filler 15, take four, action. Okay, now take a firm grip, and then slice him down the belly, like that. I've studied them so much, I can see charts on the back of my eyelids. But if I'm not right about Yamatai being in the Dragon's Triangle... I remember when you found that one of your father's digs. You ran up and showed it to me dressed in your penguin pajamas. <laughs> I was five <laughs> years old. It was my first find. Yeah. You've got great instincts, girl. You just have to trust them. Mm. That's what my father used to say. Now, there was a man that ran on instinct. For better or worse. He would have been so proud of you, Lara. We're getting closer to the storm. Well, whatever's coming, we'll get through it, eh? Hmm. <laughs>